Coming up next, uh, Barbara Drescher is going to be next, of course. Uh, her talk is Why Mensa Will Never Eliminate World Hunger. Um, it's a great title. She's the JREF's Educational Programs Consultant. Uh, she's a National Science Foundation Fellow, and her very quick haiku is Mensa tests are hard unless you're a member of, well, you know, Mensa. <laughs> Here she is, Barbara Drescher. Thank you. And thanks for coming out so early to see Richard Saunders and not leaving when <laughs> I took the stage. Hey, I'm going to jump right in and tell you a story. Um, Paul Frampton fell for a honey trap. He's a divorced man of 68. He'd begun corresponding with this woman, Denise Malani. She's a bikini model in her early 30s. And he started talking to her in November of 2011. Now, though he'd never... No slides? We have slides? Yay. Okay. So, if you can't tell, Paul is on the left, Denise is on the right. Um, so anyway, again, she's a bikini model in her early 30s, and uh, he started talking to her online in November of 2011. He never really spoke with her, not directly, it was always in text. But in January of 2012, he um, decided to set out to Bolivia, where she was doing a photo shoot, to meet her. Two weeks later, he was sitting in a jail in Buenos Aires, arrested for transporting two liter kilos of cocaine into the country. So this is what happened. Paul Frampton was sent a ticket from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, to Bolivia by way of Toronto. When he got to Toronto, he discovered that the ticket for the second leg was not valid. He waited in Toronto for another ticket, and four days later, he arrived in Bolivia, but Milani was no longer there. She had to go to Brussels for another photo shoot. But would she mind bringing a bag that she left in Bolivia? Because she'd send him another ticket to Brussels, but could he just bring this bag? It had sentimental value, apparently. Nine days later, a man handed him a black cloth suitcase, just one of those plain suitcases we you know, probably all brought one. And um, he filled it with his dirty laundry and he headed to the airport. And he was sure he was soon gonna get off a plane in Brussels and head for a hotel where he would finally meet Denise Milani. But he didn't make it out of the airport in Buenos Aires. The evidence suggests that Frampton knew the bag contained cocaine. It even suggests that he knew how much was in it. But it also suggested that he believed that Denise Milani loved him, and he seemed to think that they would sell the cocaine, get married, settle down, and have a family. So if, if you're like me, about now you're wondering just how dumb this guy is. Okay. Well, Paul Frampton's a tenured professor of physics at UNC. He's got over 450 publications. That's an astronomical amount, by the way. He's co-authored with three Nobel laureates. He's not stupid. But I don't think any of you would deny that what he did was pretty stupid. So what does this have to do with world hunger? Well, as a young adult in the late 80s, I was really searching for something. I was searching for people that I could talk to that would give me a challenge, you know science, literature, deeper meaning, all those things you look for when you're a uh, late adolescent, young adult. And that's probably why a lot of you came to this meeting to, or why you go to the local skeptics in the pub, you know, to meet other people who can talk to you about deep things that not everybody wants to talk about. Well, I joined Mensa. And I'm not afraid to admit it. I had a good excuse. I was young, <laughs> naive and ironically, pretty stupid. So those of you who haven't heard of it, Mensa is a, an organization, it's really a club, and the only criteria for membership in this club is that your IQ is in the top 2% of the population. Now, that's only one in 50 people. 
That's really not all that exclusive if you think about it. In fact, it's probably closer to 1 in 25 because of a little thing we call measurement error. Um, so a lot more than 1 in 50 probably get in. But I thought 1 in 50 at the time, I didn't know anything about statistics, and I thought 1 in 50 was probably enough to give me what I was looking for, to guarantee that there would be some smart people that I could talk to that would you know, talk about deep stuff and science and all of that. And I thought that I would probably be, feel pretty stupid when I was around them, but I, that was a good trade-off. So imagine my excitement when that packet came in the mail and I poured over the contents and there were events and special interest groups, they're called SIGs for short, that I could participate in. And so I went through the list of SIGs and I saw a bunch of cool stuff like Scrabble by mail Okay, that's fun, but if I really just, if all I wanted was a challenge in Scrabble, I could let my mom kick my ass, and she did that regularly. Um, then I saw like writer's sig, okay, that's a little more like it. Star Trek sig, hell yeah. Okay, but then I saw them. ESP sig, angels sig, astrology sig, I kind of lost interest in Mensa. It, it faded pretty quickly, and then I got a job in the software industry for a while, and I was around people who were smarter than me, and that was plenty. But then many years later, I had kids. And like a lot of people who kind of lose their, you know, not real interested in religion until they have kids, and suddenly they, they're interested because they want to make sure they raise their kids, right? Um, I rejoined Mensa. I, I, the hope was really that my very geeky kids who outrun me intellectually, I, I thought that they might feel a little more comfortable if at least once in a while they were able to hang around kids that I knew, you know, we had a test that said that they were smart. Okay, so I got the information and now I can get it all online and I saw the list of SIGs and, you know, a lot of them are still there. In fact, um, here's the list of, uh, some of the SIGs that you can currently see on the list at Mensa, there's a parapsychology SIG, there's conspiracy theories, there's a prepper SIG, there's um, the, all the usual um, religious affiliations, including atheists. Oh, you'll have to look that one up. So you asked what starving the monkeys is, so just look it up. Um, <laughs> I can't explain it, I'm sorry. Uh, it's based on a book. So I, I also did what I did before, I read the material, and I started reading the Mensa Bulletin. And one featured story informed me that science does not have a consensus regarding the man-made nature of global warming, and that AGW is a product of McCarthyism. So this was in, 19, uh, in um, 2008, so this was after the, IPP, uh, the IPCC consensus statement. The author also had some really harsh and rather ironic criticisms for the act of making claims without evidence. But her own arguments were so clearly fallacious and irrational that I was fuming. I mean, you could have seen smoke coming out of my ears. So what do I do? I write a letter to the editor and it doesn't go published. Um, neither did any letters that were really critical of this article that I could see. And I wasn't surprised. Mensa was founded over 65 years ago, primarily for the purpose of fostering intelligence for the betterment of humanity. I think that, that what they really thought, what they, what they probably thought is that if a bunch of smart people get into a room and start talking, they can solve all the world's problems. But that was 65 years ago, and frankly, I'm really not quite sure what Mensa has done other than provide some scholarships. Now, individual Mensons have, yes, because they're smart, okay? But as a group, they make games. I like the games, um, but they make games, okay? So hence, this is why Mensa will never eliminate world hunger, that the rest of it I'm, is what I'm going to be talking about here. Because intelligence just doesn't work that way, okay? Most people realize that there's a difference between, say, book smarts and street smarts. Um, you know, we talk about common sense, and I'm not even really sure what that word means, but we seem to have this intuitive understanding that intelligence is not quite what rationality is. 
But we still seem to expect that intelligence and knowledge are going to predict rational behavior or should somehow predict rational behavior as if rationality is some kind of byproduct of intelligence. And unfortunately, it's not. It's just not how it works. And we're starting to understand how that is and how to measure it. And hopefully, we will have a measure fairly soon where we can actually measure rationality separate from uh, intelligence. Even skeptics, I mean, you'll hear this several times this week, and I'm sure I've already heard it a few times. We seem to find, fall into this thinking that if we just give people the right facts, that they'll change their minds about vaccines, ESP, global warming, you name it. If we just tell people the truth, they'll change their minds. And that's just not how people work. So let's tease this apart a little bit. Um, but first, I've got to start with some, some basic definitions. Um, I think that these definitions, most, almost all cognitive psychologists will agree with them, although I've, I've simplified the, at least the rationality um, definition a bit. So I'm going to define rationality as the consistent belief structures and behavior that maxim maximize goal fulfillment. So we're not talking about what your goals are, but whether or not you make decisions and choices and take actions and hold beliefs that maximize the goals that you do have. So in other words, those thought processes and behaviors that lead you to what you really want. Okay, like eliminate world hunger. Intelligence. That which is measured by IQ tests. You can laugh at that, you didn't. Uh, maybe because you know that's true. <laughs> I'm really kind of only half joking. That's pretty much the definition of IQ. And, and we do understand what IQ measures. It does measure something. And, and I'm actually gonna pause a little bit right here and say I'm not knocking IQ. Um, I'm not knocking intelligence. I'm not knocking IQ tests. And I'm not even knocking Mensa. For one thing, IQ tests do test intelligence. The question is, what is intelligence? And understanding that we have a pretty narrow definition of what it is. And intelligence is a very, very useful thing. Okay? It just isn't the same thing as rationality. And without rationality, we don't make the kinds of decisions that solve our problems, our everyday problems, or they get us what to, to more toward our goals, that get us what we really want. And there are many, many fascinating ways that human beings are predictably irrational, and many of you are familiar with them. Things like, we tend to think that more is always better. We fail miserably at understanding probabilities and assessing risks. We look for evidence for what we believe, rather than believe what the evidence tells us is true. The people we like, always innocent, always good, always right. We buy lottery tickets. We play roulette. Hopefully none of you have done that this weekend. And we buy extended warranties. We're afraid to fly, but we drive drunk. Because who doesn't drive better when they're drunk, right? But we're capable of overriding all these natural tendencies. Okay? Our brains are not broken. They just have a default setting. And rather than talk more about the ways in which we're irrational, which you'll get lots of, especially if you've done some of the workshops, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about why, what keeps us from overcoming those things and, and being rational. And one of the take home messages is be, it's not usually because we're stupid. Intelligence is a factor in rationality, but it's a smaller one than, than some of us may think. And, just to give you an example, when we give instructions to people to avoid these biases and heuristics and we show them to them or we make it obvious, then all of a sudden people with high intelligence do better on those tasks. They succeed at tasks that they normal, normally would have failed on. Okay? So it's sort of like when you tell them what to do, suddenly they know what to do and they do it. So Paul Frampton wasn't stupid. We're not irrational just because we're stupid. The Mensa member who wrote that article wasn't stupid. Um, George W. Bush isn't stupid. Really. <laughs> He's not. 
What is the problem? He is irrational, okay? <laughs> so to tease this out, we need to look a little bit about how we measure good thinking, and, and then I'll get to the difference between them. Now, psychologists, we differentiate in our measurements between things like optimal situations and typical situations. And we're talking about performance situations because when we measure, we often measure performance. Sometimes it's attitudes, but optimal performance situations are situations in which the participants aware that they're expected to do their best. They know what they need to do to maximize their performance. And what we want to know, really, what the experimenter wants to know is what people can do. In a typical performance situation, they usually, the instructions are fuzzy, the goals can be fuzzy at times. Um, we don't make it obvious, we don't make things obvious. Um, and what we really wanna know is what people will do. Typical performance situations quite often don't have a correct answer. So that it isn't a matter of um, performance so, matters, uh, uh, so much as it is a matter of trying to determine what people prefer. Okay. So IQ tests are optimal performance situations. So what they're measuring is something that we call cognitive abilities. Unfortunately, Rationality can't be assessed without at least including some typical performance situations. Because it's sort of by definition, we want to know if you're making good choices. We not, want to know not if you can make good choices, but if you will make good choices. And typical performance situations measure something we call thinking dispositions. Sometimes they also measure ability, but ability can't necessarily tap into these thinking dispositions. Now, thinking dispositions are things like they're rooted in personal goals. They're rooted in goals, beliefs, belief structure, and attitudes about belief, how to form beliefs, changing beliefs. Um, some examples of thinking dispositions are um, open-mindedness, consideration for future consequences, so long-term thinking, dogmatism, superstition, the need for cognition, and there are other, there's actually quite a long list here. Some things like need for closure, kind of the opposite of the need for cognition. And um, to be rational, we need to not only know when to override that default thinking, but we have to actually put it in place, okay? So it requires more than critical thinking, more than problem solving ability. It requires us to hold our current worldview in a kind of escrow. You know, while we hold, while we consider an alternative view with an open mind, and some of these thinking dis um, dispositions get in the way of that. I mean, clearly things like dogmatism are going to get in the way of you holding your current beliefs back, so that you can examine something in with an open mind. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, some of the thinking dispositions that get in the way of being rational. One of them is that last one, need for cognition. What we're really referring to is um, how a variation among people and how much they want to think about something. Something we call intellectual curiosity. This is one of the things that the, a lot of people say Bush did not have was intellectual curiosity. If you're not, if you're not willing to or you're not, you don't have a desire to think something through, you won't necessarily. We are naturally cognitive misers. You've probably heard that term several times this weekend already. And that means that we use as little energy as possible to meet our goals. What we don't always consider is, are we meeting our actual goals? And I'm gonna give you an example here. This is a great problem that I like. Um, it's a classic. Jack is looking at Anne, but Anne is looking at George. Jack is married, George is not. Is a married person looking at an unmarried person? You have three options, yes, no, and cannot be determined. Okay, very quickly without thinking about it too much, who says yes? Who says no? Who says cannot be determined? Aha, congratulations, you're normal people, but you're wrong. Okay, um, the key here is 
We've got a situation, if you're like most people, you said C, okay, but the correct answer is A. Most people notice that they don't know anything about an, okay, and you see an option for cannot be determined and you stop there. Now, when we present this same problem without the option of cannot be determined, you have to answer yes or no. People put a little more work into it. The cognitive miser can no longer be miserly because you can't get to an answer by, by just leaving it there, okay? You have to think of the alternatives. Here's the possibilities. If you think about it, Anne is either married or unmarried, and you'll, you won't know if she's married or unmarried, but it doesn't, you'll, if you think about those possibilities, then you'll realize that it doesn't matter. Because if Anne is married, well then she's looking at George, who's not married. And if Anne is not married, she, Jack is looking at her. So either way, the answer's correct, okay? Yeah, a lot of you are going, oh, and now it's obvious, <laughs> right? But we have to actually take the time to consider those alternatives so that we realize that we can solve our problems. And a lot of time I think people just throw their hands up thinking they can't solve the problem. Okay, so that need for cognition is one of those thinking dispositions that affect rationality. And there's actually many, I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of giving a composite view here. Uh, because there's too many. <laughs> and some of them are very highly related. Like open-mindedness, adherence to belief, and flexible thinking. These are all related, and they're actually related to the next bullet point I have. Um, overconfidence and one-sided thinking. That's a big one. The more overconfident we are, we are the less open-minded we're going to be, and the less flexible we're going to be, because we think we're right. We don't think we have a reason to, think, to listen to what somebody else is saying. And now, why is this so bad? Well, returning to our professor and drug smuggler, Paul Frampton was warned by a friend and colleague when he was in Bolivia. He called a friend and told him what was going on, and the friend said, okay, who's your next of kin? Because you're not coming home. Um, and he laughed it off, okay? But the text messages that he sent to Milani while he was waiting in the airport made it clear that he knew about the, the cocaine. He actually thought those messages would exonerate him, even though they're all about selling the cocaine. Because he thought that it would, it would exonerate him because it also made it clear that he was transporting the bag for someone else. Somehow that was okay. In his eyes, he was innocent because it wasn't his bag. And it should be no surprise to any of the psychologists in the, the audience that Two psychologists uh, testified that Frampton had traits of narcissistic personality disorder. Um, his downfall was overconfidence. Okay, so that's one of those thinking dispositions that he was real low on, well, I guess real high on overconfidence. Um, and, and if you're overconfident, you don't even think about the way the rest of the world might work. And that can put you in hot water in a lot of ways. It's also very damaging in everyday life. And Dylan Keenberg and I conducted a study a few years ago after noticing a correlation between entitlement attitudes, study habits, and academic performance. And we learned that students with high entitlement attitudes were the most overconfident. And that shouldn't be surprising. But they were also the least competent. And that's the Dunning-Kruger effect, for those of you who are familiar with it. And for those of you who aren't, please look it up. It's excellent. They tend to attribute academic performances to outside control, things that are outside of their control, like the teacher or the test, the type of test. Um, and these students also tend to use poorly, poor study strategies like flashcards and memorizing bullets on lecture slides and things. And this created something that I call, oops, um, a cycle of incompetence. Okay, I'm actually going to, um, backtrack a little bit here, and talk about the, um, some of the reasons we're irrational. And then I'll show you the cycle of incompetence. We are, the things that we think we're irrational about, we think we're irrational sometimes because we're stupid, because we lack some information or lack of um, education, so that's ignorance as well. But the things that we overlook are the things that are related to thinking dispositions. They were lazy. We're cognitive misers, and we're overconfident. I call that arrogant. 
Um, so we are irrational for many different ways, for many different reasons. Sometimes it's because we're stupid, sometimes because we're ignorant, sometimes because we're lazy, and sometimes because we're arrogant, and sometimes it's some combination of the above. Um, and that's just a short list, really. Okay, so here's our cycle of incompetence. What happens is students don't know that they don't know. They, don't, they think they understand the material. The feedback they get that says that they doesn't, they don't, is dismissed as somebody else's, you know, the teacher hates me or, you know, I just don't know how to answer the question, right? And so they don't think that, that they need to change their ways. And they feel entitled to continue with the poor study strategies. They also feel entitled to get good grades. Um, so I want to also talk about why it's so important that we are more rational. And this is a study, this is a study that, that demonstrates cognitive laziness. You ask people to allocate 100 livers to 200 children who need liver transplants. And they do pretty much what you expect them to do when you tell them a group A has 100 children and group B has 100 children. They give 50 to each. But then when you tell them that group A, um, all the children in group A only have an 80% chance of survival, surviving the surgery, and group B has a 20% chance of surviving the surgery, what happens is you don't get everybody giving the livers to group A. Only a quarter of the people give all of the livers to group A with the best chance of survival. Another quarter still divide it 50-50, and the rest are in between. And what's so bad about that is the difference between these two choices is 30 dead children. They're not meeting their goals. What their goal is is to save as many children as possible. And when they ask people, why do you still give livers to the children who don't have as great a chance of surviving, people say things like, oh, I want to give them hope. And one person even said that um, they believe in God and God doesn't work in numbers. So we could accept those answers and we could consider, hey, it's emotion driving their choices. But the problem is, is they've done a study to test that. Um, when they allocate the livers to children individually and then they list them in order of survival chance, people have absolutely no trouble giving all of the livers to the top 100 children. It was only when they grouped them that they tried to distribute them evenly. So, all, the, all that language about hope and everything, it's great and it's compassionate, but it's a justification for being lazy and not getting what you really want. Because what, what should happen here is you should see this kind of a distribution if what they wanted to do was give the kids at the bottom hope. And you actually see this distribution. So, one of the last take-home messages that I want to give you is we all believe that we're rational, okay? And it's clear that when we aren't rational, we're giving all of our power to somebody else, somebody who knows how to frame the questions to get us to answer in a way that they want us to answer and not in a way that's going to meet our goals. We all think that we're rational. We all think that we're we also all know, especially in this room, we all know how human beings are irrational. But time and time again, I seem to witness people thinking that that means other human beings and not ourselves. And it's really important to turn the mirror on that and think about it yourself. And think about the ways that you are irrational. And finally, if you want to read more, these are some of the best books. There are many more. Um, one of the authors is here, actually, you'll hear from him later today. And a lot of the material that I talked about today is in that last one, uh, What Intelligence Tests Miss. But uh, Carol Tavers is also a, a common tamer, and um, these are, well, there are, I wouldn't choose between them. They're all great books. Thank you. Barbara Drescher, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Barbara, very nice.